In the year 1843, a man was born who, during his lifetime, was to have a profound effect on millions of people. His name was Russell Herman Conwell. He became a lawyer, then a newspaper editor, and finally a clergyman. Well, one day, a group of boys came to Dr. Conwell at his church and asked him if he would be willing to instruct them in college courses. They wanted a college education, but lacked the money to pay for it. He told them that he'd do all he could, and as the boys left, a thought, an idea began to form in Dr. Conwell's mind. He asked himself, why couldn't there be a fine college for poor but deserving young men? Well, here was a great idea, and he went to work on it at once. Almost single-handedly, Dr. Conwell raised seven million dollars with which he founded one of the world's leading universities. And he raised the money by giving more than 6,000 lectures all over the country, and in each one of them, he told the story called Acres of Diamonds. The story was the account of an African farmer who heard tales about other settlers who had made millions by discovering diamond mines. And these tales so excited the farmer that he could hardly wait to sell his farm and search for diamonds himself. So he sold his farm and spent the rest of his life wandering the vast African continent, searching unsuccessfully for the gleaming gems which brought such high prices on the markets of the world. Finally, in a fit of despondency, broke and desperate, as I remember the story, he threw himself into a river and drowned. Now, meanwhile, the man who had bought his farm one day found a large and unusual stone in a stream which cut through the property. And the stone turned out to be a great diamond of enormous value. And he then discovered that the farm was covered with them. And it was to become one of the world's richest diamond mines. The first farmer had owned literally acres of diamonds, but had sold them for practically nothing in order to look for them elsewhere. If he'd only taken the time to study and prepare himself, to learn what diamonds looked like in their rough state, and had first thoroughly explored the land he owned, he would have found the millions he sought right on his own property. The thing about this story that so profoundly affected Dr. Conwell and subsequently millions of others was the idea that each of us is, at this moment, standing in the middle of his own acres of diamonds. If we will only have the wisdom and patience to intelligently and effectively explore the work in which we're now engaged, we'll usually find that it contains the riches we seek, whether they be financial or intangible or both. There's nothing more pitiful to my mind than the person who wastes his life running from one thing to another, forever looking for the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and never staying with one thing long enough to find it. No matter what your goal may be, perhaps the road to it can be found in the very thing in which you're now engaged. You see, the average man believes some businesses are better than others, instead of realizing the truth that there are no bad businesses. There are just those people who don't know enough to see the opportunities in the work they're in. No matter what our work happens to be, it's our business. We're the manager. If there seems to be no future or opportunity in it, it isn't always because it's not there, but perhaps only because we can't see it. A farmer once poked a tiny pumpkin into an empty jug. The pumpkin grew until it completely filled the jug and could grow no more. When the farmer broke the glass, he had a pumpkin exactly the size and shape of the jug. If we're not careful, each of us can do a similar thing. We can mistakenly poke ourselves into jugs that limit our growth. But it is we who do the poking, not the job, not the company, nor the territory, nor the economy, nor the times. We do it. People who become outstanding at their work are those who see their work as an opportunity for growth and development and who prepare themselves for the opportunities which surround them every day. Preparation is the key. This means becoming so good, so competent at what we're now doing, we will actually force the opportunities we seek to come our way. It takes imagination, creative imagination, to know that diamonds don't look like diamonds in their rough state, nor does a pile of iron ore look like iron or steel. Great opportunities lurk constantly in every aspect of the work in which we now find ourselves. In order to begin prospecting your acres of diamonds, start to develop a faculty called intelligent objectivity, the ability to stand off and look at your job as a stranger might, a stranger who considers your pasture greener than his own. To do this, start at the beginning. 
Within the framework of what industry or profession does your job fall? Do you know all you can know about your industry? How did it begin? Why did it begin? Who started it and when? What's your industry's annual dollar volume? How fast has it grown during the past 20 years? What's its projected growth during the next 10 years? In short, start now to become a student of your industry. You'll be amazed at the results. In five years or less, you can become a national expert in your field. And it's the experts who write their own tickets in life. Surveys indicate that the great majority of people seem to look at their jobs as being as far as they can go, as the end of the line. They need to realize how really desperately an expanding and dynamic industry needs and seeks the uncommon person who is prepared to share in its growth, how richly it will reward this person of vision and action. On the other hand, those who are not preparing and growing are not just standing still. In relation to their industry, they're going backwards. So ask yourself, do I know as much about my job and my industry as a good doctor or lawyer knows about his job, his profession? You should, you know. This is the attitude of the person who wants to become a professional at what he does for a living. It's far more fun, many times more rewarding and interesting, and the real pro can ride out occasional storms in the economic seas in a safe boat built of research and preparation. In order to become a professional in a world of amateurs, we need to study three important subjects. One, our company and the industry in which it operates. Two, our job and perhaps the next step upward in our career. And three, we need to study people, since successfully serving and getting along with people will determine our success or failure. These are three subjects on which you can gradually build a fine home library. Your bookstore clerk will help you find the right books if you'll tell him what you want to know. Frequently, all you need in order to make an enormous improvement is simply a reminder of things you've known but have forgotten. Perhaps this study and research in your job, your industry, and ways of increasing your service to others sounds like a big job. Well, it is, but it's fascinating, and in the long run, it pays tremendous dividends, builds complete security, and it can be accomplished in an hour a day devoted to reading and making permanent notes. Think of ways and means by which you can increase your contribution to your company, your industry, and those whom you serve. You'll begin to notice a wonderful change in your world, for as ye sow, so shall ye reap. This applies just as much to the family as it does to the breadwinner. The minute you adopt this attitude, you've joined the top 5% of the people of the world. You've virtually removed all competition. You're creating rather than competing. You're affecting life rather than just being affected by it. You're becoming a creator and a giver to life instead of just a receiver. By taking this attitude toward your work, your company and industry, you're automatically taking care of two vital parts of successful living. First, you'll find yourself becoming more interested and enthusiastic about your work and its future, and both interest and enthusiasm are contagious. And second, you're building financial security which will last a lifetime. So keep this thought in mind as often as you can on and off the job. Somewhere in your present work, there lurks an opportunity which will bring you everything you could possibly want for yourself and your family. It will not be labeled opportunity. It will be hidden in common, everyday garments, just as was the hairpin with which a man fashioned the first paper clip, or the dirty drinking glass which triggered the paper cup industry. Now, in closing, here are 12 points to remember. One, if we'll develop the wisdom and patience to intelligently and effectively explore the work in which we're now engaged, we will very likely find it contains the riches, tangible and intangible, we seek. Two, before we go running off into what we think are greener pastures, let's realize our own pasture is probably unlimited. Three, there are no bad jobs. It's the way in which we go about our work that makes it good or bad. Four, let's not poke ourselves into jugs beyond which we cannot grow. Let's avoid self-limitation. Five, only preparation can ensure our taking advantage of the opportunities which will present themselves in the future, opportunities which are around us now. Let's begin to prepare now. Six, put your imagination to work on the many ways and means of improving what you're now doing. Seven, learn all you can about your job, your company, and your industry. Eight, since there's no limit to the growth of your industry, it must follow there's similarly no limit to your growth potential within that industry. Nine, our dynamic and growing economy needs and will well reward the uncommon person who prepares for a place in its growth. 
10, begin to build your library of reference material pertaining to your company, industry, job, and on how to better serve and get along with people. 11, set aside an hour a day for this study and research. 12, remember the story of the Acres of Diamonds.